Gollum was tugging at Frodo's cloak and hissing with fear and impatience. We must go, he said. We mustn't stand here. My chest. Reluctantly, Frodo turned his back on the west and followed as his guide led him out into the darkness of the east. They left the ring of trees and crept along the roads toward the mountains. This road, too, ran straight for a while, but soon it began to bend away southwards, until it came right under the great shoulder of rock that they had seen from the distance. Black and forbidding it loomed above them, darker than the dark sky behind. Crawling under its shadow the road went on, and rounding it sprang east again and began to climb steeply. Frodo and Sam were plodding along with heavy hearts, no longer able to care greatly about their peril. Frodo's head was bowed, his burden was dragging him down again. As soon as the great crossroads had been passed, the weight of it, almost forgotten in Ithilien, had begun to grow once more. Now, feeling the way become steep before his feet, he looked wearily up. And then he saw it, even as Gollum had said that he would. The city of the ring wraiths. He cowered against the stone bank. A long tilted valley, a deep gulf of shadow, ran back into the mountains. Upon the further side, some way within the valley's arms, high on a rocky seat, upon the black knees of the Ethel Duath, stood the walls and tower of Minas Morgul. All was dark about it, earth and sky, but it was lit with light. Not the imprisoned moonlight welling through the marble walls of Minas Ithil long ago, tower of the moon fair and radiant in the hollow of the hills. Paler indeed than the moon ailing in some slow eclipse was the light of it now, wavering and blowing like a noisome exhalation of decay. A corpse light. A light that illuminated nothing. In the walls and tower windows showed, like countless black holes looking inward into emptiness. But the topmost course of the tower revolved slowly, first one way, and then another. A huge ghostly head leering into the night. For a moment the three companions stood there, shrinking, staring up with unwilling eyes. Gollum was the first to recover. Again he pulled at their cloaks urgently, but he spoke no word. Almost he dragged them forward. Every step was reluctant, and time seemed to slow its pace, so that between the raising of a foot and the setting of it down, minutes of loathing passed. So they came slowly to the white bridge. Here the road, gleaming faintly, passed over the stream in the midst of the valley, and went on, winding deviously up towards the city's gate a black mouth opening in the outer circle of the northward walls. Wide flats lay on either bank, shadowy meads filled with pale white flowers. Luminous these were too, beautiful and yet horrible of shape, like the demented forms in an uneasy dream. And they gave forth a faint, sickening, charnel smell. An odor of rottenness filled the air. From mead to mead the bridge sprang, Figures stood there at its head, carved with cunning in forms human and bestial, but all corrupt and loathsome. The water flowing beneath was silent, and it steamed, but the vapour that rose from it, curling and twisting about the bridge, was deadly cold. Frodo felt his senses reeling and his mind darkening. Then suddenly, as if some force were at work other than his own will, he began to hurry forward, his groping hands held out, his head rolling from side to side. Both Sam and Gollum ran after him. Sam caught his master in his arms as he stumbled and almost fell, right on the threshold of the bridge. Oh no, not that way, whispered Gollum, but the breath between his teeth seemed to tear the heavy stillness like a whistle, and he cowered to the ground in terror. Hold up, Mr. Frodo, muttered Sam in Frodo's ear. Come back! Not that way! Gollum says not, and for once I agree with him! Frodo passed his hand over his brow and wrenched his eyes away from the city on the hill. The luminous tower fascinated him, and he fought the desire that was on him to run up the gleaming road towards its gate. 
At last, with an effort, he turned back, and as he did so, he felt the ring resisting him, dragging him at the chain about his neck, and his eyes too, as he looked away, seemed for the moment to have been blinded. The darkness before him was impenetrable. Gollum, crawling on the ground like a frightened animal, was already vanishing into the gloom. Sam, supporting and guiding his stumbling master, followed after him as quickly as he could. Not far from the near bank of the stream there was a gap in the stone wall beside the road. Through this they passed, and Sam saw that they were on a narrow path that gleamed faintly at first, as the main road did, until climbing above the meads of deadly flowers it faded and went dark, winding its crooked way up into the northern sides of the valley. Along this path the hobbits trudged, side by side, unable to see Gollum in front of them, except when he turned back and beckoned them on. Then his eyes shone with a green-white light, reflecting the noisome morgul sheen, perhaps, or kindled by some answering mood within. Of that deadly gleam and the dark eye-holes, Frodo and Sam were always conscious, ever glancing fearfully over their shoulders, and ever dragging their eyes back to find the darkening path. Slowly they labored on. As they rose above the stench and vapors of the poisonous stream, their breath became easier and their heads clearer. But now their limbs were deadly tired as if they had walked all night under a burden, or had been swimming long against a heavy tide of water. At last they could go no further without a halt. Frodo stopped and sat down on a stone. They had now climbed up to the top of a great hump of bare rock. Ahead of them there was a bay in the valley side, and round the head of this the path went on. No more than a wide ledge with a chasm on the right. Across the sheer southward face of the mountain it crawled upwards until it disappeared into the blackness above. I must rest a while, Sam, whispered Frodo. It's heavy on me, Sam, lad. Very heavy. I wonder how far I can carry it. Anyway, I must rest before we venture on to that. He pointed to the narrow way ahead. Shh! hissed Gollum, hurrying back to them. His fingers were on his lips as he shook his head urgently. Tugging at Frodo's sleeve, he pointed towards the path, but Frodo would not move. Not yet, he said. Not yet. Weariness and more than weariness oppressed him. It seemed as if a heavy spell was laid on his mind and body. I must rest, he muttered. At this, Gollum's fear and agitation became so great that he spoke again, hissing behind his hand as if to keep the sound from unseen listeners in the air. Not here. No, no rest here, fools. As they see us, when they come to the bridge, they will see us. Come away. Climb, climb, climb. Come, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. He's right again. We can't stay here. Right, said Frodo with a remote voice, as if one speaking half asleep. I will try. Wearily, he got to his feet. But it was too late. At that moment, the rock quivered and trembled beneath them. The great rumbling noise, louder than ever before, rolled in the ground and echoed in the mountains. Then, with searing suddenness, there came a great red flash. Far beyond the eastern mountains, it leapt into the sky and splashed the lowering clouds with crimson. In that valley of shadow and cold, deathly light seemed unbearably violent and fierce. Peaks of stone and ridges like notched knives sprang out in staring black against the uprushing flame in Gorgoroth. Then came a great crack of thunder. And Minas Morgul answered. There was a flare of living lightnings, forks of blue flame springing up from the tower and from the encircling hills into the southern clouds. The earth groaned, and out of the city there came a cry, mingled with harsh high voices as birds of prey, and the shrill neighing of horses wild with rage and fear, there came a rendering screech, shivering, rising swiftly to a piercing pitch beyond the range of hearing. The hobbits wheeled round towards it and cast themselves down, holding their hands upon their ears. As the terrible cry ended, falling back through a long, sickening wail to silence, Frodo slowly raised his head. Across the narrow valley, now almost on a level with his eyes, the walls of the evil city stood, and its cavernous gate, 
shaped like an open mouth with gleaming teeth, was gaping wide. And out of the gate, an army came. All that host was clad in sable, dark as the night. Against the wan walls and the luminous pavement of the road, Frodo could see them. Small black figures in rank upon rank, marching swiftly and silently, passing outwards in an endless stream. Before them went a great cavalry of horsemen, moving like ordered shadows. And at their head was one greater than all the rest. A rider, all black, save that on his hooded head he had a helm like a crown that flickered with a perilous light. Now he was drawing near the bridge below, and Frodo's staring eyes followed him, unable to wink or to withdraw. Surely there was the Lord of the Nine Riders returned to Earth to lead his ghastly host to battle? Here, yes, here indeed was the haggard king whose cold hand had smitten down the ring-bearer with his deadly knife. The old wound throbbed with pain and a great chill spread towards Frodo's heart. Even as these thoughts pierced him with dread and held him bound as with a spell, the rider halted suddenly, right before the entrance of the bridge. And behind him all the hosts stood still. There was a pause, a dead silence. Maybe it was the ring that called to the Wraith Lord, and for a moment he was troubled, sensing some other power within his valley. This way and that turned the dark head helmed and crowned with fear, sweeping the shadows with its unseen eyes. Frodo waited, like a bird at the approach of a snake, unable to move. And as he waited, he felt more urgent than ever before the command that he should put on the ring. But great as the pressure was, he felt no inclination now to yield to it. He knew that the ring would only betray him, and that he had not, even if he put it on, the power to face the Morgul King. Not yet. There was no longer any answer to that command in his own will, dismayed by terror though it was. And he felt only the beating upon him of a great power from outside. It took his hand, and as Frodo watched with his mind, not willing it, but in suspense, as if he looked on some old story far away, it moved the hand inch by inch towards the chain upon his neck. Then his own will stirred. Slowly it forced the hand back, and set it to find another thing, a thing lying hidden near his breast. Cold and hard it seemed as his grip closed on it. The vial of Galadriel, so long treasured and almost forgotten till that hour. As he touched it, for a while all thought of the ring was banished from his mind. He sighed and bent his head. At that moment the Wraith King turned and spurred his horse and rode across the bridge. And all his dark host followed him. Maybe the elven hoods defied his unseen eyes, and the mind of his small enemy, being strengthened, had turned aside his thought. But he was in haste. Already the hour had struck. And at his great master's bidding, he must march with war into the west. Soon he had passed, like a shadow into shadow, down the winding road, and behind him still the black ranks crossed the bridge. So great an army had never issued from that vale since the days of Isildur's might. No host so fell and strong in arms had yet assailed the fords of Anduin, and yet it was but one and not the greatest of the hosts that Mordor now sent forth. Frodo stirred, and suddenly his heart went out to Faramir. The storm has burst at last, he thought. This great array of spears and swords is going to Osgiliath. Will Faramir get across in time? He guessed it, but did he know the hour? Who can now hold the forge when the King of the Nine Riders comes? And other armies will come. I am too late. All is lost. I tarried on the way. All is lost. Even if my errand is performed, no one will ever know. There will be no one I can tell. It will be in vain. Overcome with weakness, he wept. 
and still the host of Morgul crossed the bridge. Then at a great distance, as if it came out of memories of the Shire, some sunlit early morning when the day called and doors were opening, he heard Sam's voice speaking. Wake up, Mr. Frodo! Wake up! Had the voice added, Your breakfast is ready, he would hardly have been surprised. Certainly Sam was urgent. Wake up, Mr. Frodo! They're gone, he said. There was a dull clang. The gates of Minas Morgul had closed. The last rank of spears had vanished down the road. The tower still grinned across the valley, but the light was fading in it. The whole city was falling back into a dark brooding shade and silence. Yet still it was filled with watchfulness. Wake up, Mr. Frodo. They're gone. And we'd better go too. There's something still alive in that place. Something with eyes. Or a seeing mind, if you take me. And the longer we stay in one spot, the sooner it will get on to us. Come on, Mr. Frodo. Frodo raised his head. And then stood up. Despair had not left him, but the weakness had passed. He even smiled grimly feeling now as clearly as a moment before he had felt the opposite. That what he had to do, he had to do. If he could, and that whether Faramir or Aragorn or Elrond or Galadriel or Gandalf or anyone else ever knew about it was beside the purpose. He took his staff in one hand and the file in his other. When he saw that the clear light was already welling through his fingers, he thrust it into his bosom and held it against his heart. Then turning from the city of Morgul, now no more than a grey glimmer across a dark gulf, he prepared to take the upward road. Gollum, it seemed, had crawled off along the edge into the darkness beyond, when the gates of Minas Morgul opened, leaving the hobbits where they lay. He now came creeping back, his teeth chattering and his fingers snapping. Foolish! Silly! He hissed. Make haste! They mustn't think danger has passed. It hasn't. Make haste. They did not answer, but they followed him on the climbing ledge. It was little to the liking of either of them, not even after facing so many other perils. But it did not last long. Soon the path reached a rounded angle where the mountainside swelled out again, and there it suddenly entered a narrow opening in the rock. They had come to the first stair that Gollum had spoken of. The darkness was almost complete and they could see nothing much beyond their hands stretch. But Gollum's eyes shone pale, several feet above, as he turned back towards them. Careful, he whispered. Steps. Must be careful. Care was certainly needed. Frodo and Sam at first felt easier, having now a wall on either side, but the stairway was almost as steep as a ladder. And as they climbed up and up, they became more and more aware of the long black fall behind them. And the steps were narrow, spaced unevenly, and often treacherous. They were worn and smooth at the edges, and some were broken, and some cracked as foot was set upon them. The hobbits struggled on, until at last they were clinging with desperate fingers to the steps ahead, and forcing their aching knees to bend and straighten and ever as the stair cut its way deeper into the sheer mountain, the rocky walls rose higher and higher above their heads. At length, just as they felt that they could endure no more, they saw Gollum's eyes peering down at them again. We are up, he whispered. First stairs passed. Clever hobbits to climb so high. Very clever hobbits. Just a few more little steps and that's all. Yes. Dizzy and very tired, Sam and Frodo following him, crawled up the last step and sat down, rubbing their legs and knees. They were in a deep, dark passage that seemed still to go up before them, though at a gentler slope and without steps. Gollum did not let them rest long. There is another stair still, he said. Much longer stair. Rest when we get to the top of next stair. Not yet. Sam groaned. How oh, longer did you say? He asked. Yes, yes, longer said Gollum. But not so difficult. Hobbits have climbed the straight stair. Next comes the winding stair. And what after that? said Sam. We 
said Gollum softly. I thought you said there was a tunnel, said Sam. Isn't there a tunnel or something to go through? Oh yes, there's a tunnel, said Gollum. But hobbits can rest before they try that. If they get through that, they'll be nearly at the top. Very nearly. If they get through that, oh yes. Frodo shivered. The climb had made him sweat. But now he felt cold and clammy, and there was a chill draught in the dark passage, blowing down from the invisible heights above. He got up and shook himself. Well, let's go on, he said. This is no place to sit in. The passage seemed to go on for miles, and always the chill air flowed over them, rising as they went on to a bitter wind. The mountains seemed to be trying with their deadly breath to daunt them, to turn them back from the secrets of the high places, or to blow them away into the darkness behind. They only knew that they had come to the end, when suddenly they felt no wall at their right hand. They could see very little. Great black shapeless masses and deep grey shadows loomed above them and about them. But now and again a dull red light flickered up under the lowering clouds. And for a moment they were aware of tall peaks, in front and on either side, like pillars holding up a vast sagging roof. They seemed to have climbed up many hundreds of feet onto a wide shelf. A cliff was on their left, and a chasm on their right. Gollum led the way close under the cliff. For the present they were no longer climbing, but the ground was now more broken and dangerous in the dark, and there were blocks and lumps of fallen stone in the way. Their going was slow and cautious. How many hours had passed since they had entered Mogul Vale, neither Sam nor Frodo could any longer guess. The night seemed endless. At length they were once more aware of a wall looming up, and once more a stairway opened before them. Again they halted, and again they began to climb. It was a long and weary ascent, but this stairway did not delve into the mountainside. Here the huge cliff face sloped backwards, and the path, like a snake, wound to and fro across it. At one point it crawled sideways, right to the edge of the dark chasm, and Frodo, glancing down, saw below him, as a vast deep pit, the great ravine at the head of the Morgul Valley. Down in its depths glimmered like a glowworm thread, the wraith road from the dead city to the nameless pass. He turned hastily away. Still on and up, the stairway bent and crawled, until at last, with the final flight, short and straight, it climbed out again on to another level. The path had veered away from the main pass in the great ravine, and it now followed its own perilous course at the bottom of a lesser cleft among the higher regions of the Ethel Duath. Dimly the hobbits could discern tall piers and jagged pinnacles of stone on either side, between which were great crevices and fissures blacker than the night, where forgotten winters had gnawed and carved the sunless stone. And now the red light in the sky seemed stronger though they could not tell whether a dreadful morning were indeed coming to this place of shadow, or whether they saw only the flame of some great violence of Sauron in the torment of Gorgoroth beyond. Still far ahead, and still high above, Frodo looked up, saw, as he guessed, the very crown of this bitter road. Against the sullen redness of the eastern sky, a cleft was outlined in the topmost ridge. Narrow deep cloven between two black shoulders, and on either shoulder was a horn of stone. He paused and looked more attentively. The horn upon the left was tall and slender, and it burned the red light, or else the red light in the land beyond was shining through a hole. He saw now. It was a black tower, poised above the outer pass. He touched Sam's arm and pointed. Oh, I don't like the look of that said Sam. So this secret way of yours is guarded after all, he growled, turning to Gollum. As you knew all along, I suppose. Always hobbits, yes, said Gollum. Of course they are, but hobbits must try some way. This may be the least watched. Perhaps they've all gone away to big battle, perhaps. Perhaps, grunted Sam. Well, it still seems a long way off, and a long way up before we get there. And there's still the tunnel. I think you ought to rest now, Mr. Frodo. I don't know what time of day or night it is, but we've kept going for hours and hours. Yes, we must rest, said Frodo. 
Let us find some corner out of the wind and gather a strength for the last lap. For so he felt it to be. The terrors of the land beyond and the deed to be done there seemed remote, too far off yet to trouble him. All his mind was bent on getting through or over this impenetrable wall and guard. If once he could do that impossible thing, then somehow the errand would be accomplished. Or so it seemed to him in that dark hour of weariness, still laboring in the stony shadows under Kirithungol. In a dark crevice between two great piers of rock they sat down, Frodo and Sam a little way within, and Gollum crouched upon the ground near the opening. There the hobbits took what they expected would be their last meal before they went down into the nameless land. Maybe the last meal they would ever eat together. Some of the food of Gondor they ate, and wafers of the way bread of the elves, and they drank a little, but of their water they were sparing and took only enough to moisten their dry mouths. I wonder when they'll find water again, said Sam. But I suppose even over there they drink. The orcs drink, don't they? Yes, they drink, said Frodo. But do not let us speak of that. Such drink is not for us. Have then all the more need to fill our bottles, said Sam. But there isn't any water up here. Not a sound or trickle have I heard. And anyway, Faramir said that we were not to drink any water in Morgul. No water flowing out of Imlad Morgul were his words, said Frodo. We are not in that valley now. And if we came on a spring, it would be flowing into it and not out of it. I wouldn't trust it said Sam. Not till I was dying of thirst. Oh, there's a wicked feeling about this place. He sniffed. And that smell, I fancy. Do you notice it? A queer kind of smell. Stuffy. I don't like it. I don't like anything here at all. Said Frodo. Step on none. Breath of bone. Earth, air, and water all seem accursed. <sighs> so our path is laid. Yes, that's so, said Sam. And we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo. Adventures, as I used to call them. I used to think that they were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for. Because they wanted them. Because they were exciting and life was a bit dull. Kind of a sport, as you might say. <laughs> but that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered. Or the ones that stayed in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them, usually. Their paths were laid that way, as you put it. But I expect they had lots of chances, like us, of turning back. Only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know because they'd have been forgotten. We hear about those as just went on, and not all to a good end, mind you. At least not what folk inside a story, not outside it, call a good end. You know, coming home and finding things all right, though not quite the same, like old Mr. Bilbo. But those aren't always the best tales to hear, though they may be the best tales to get landed in. I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into. I wonder, said Frodo. But I don't know. And that's the way of a real tale. Take any one that you're fond of. You may know or guess what kind of tale it is. Happy ending or sad ending. But the people in it don't know. And you don't want them to know. No, sir, of course not. Baron, now. He never thought he was going to get that Silmaril from the Iron Crown in Thangorodrim. And yet he did. And that was a worse place and a blacker danger than ours. But that's a long stale, of course and goes on past the happiness and into grief and beyond it. And the Silmaril went on and came to Arendil. And why, sir, I never thought of that before. But you've got, you've got some of that light of it in that star glass that the lady gave you. Why, to think of it, we're in the same tale still. It's going on. <laughs> Don't the great tales ever end? They never end as tales, said Frodo. But the people in them come and go when their parts ended. Our part will end later. Or sooner. And then we can have some rest and some sleep. Said Sam. He laughed grimly. <laughs> and I mean just that, Mr. Frodo. I mean plain ordinary jest and sleep. And waking up to a morning's work in the garden. 
I'm afraid that's all I'm hoping for all the time. All the big important plans are not for my sort. Still, I wonder if we shall ever be put into songs or tales. We're in one, of course, but I mean, put into words. You know, told by the fireside. Or read out of a great big book with red and black letters. Years and years afterwards. And people will say, let's hear about Frodo and the ring. And they'll say, yes, that's one of my favorite stories. Frodo was very brave, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy, the famousness of hobbits. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> it's saying a lot too much, said Frodo. And he laughed, a long, clear laugh from his heart. <laughs> Such a sound had not been heard in those plains since Sauron came to Middle-earth. To Sam, suddenly it seemed as if all the stones were listening and the tall rocks leaning over them. But Frodo did not heed them. He laughed again. <laughs> Why, Sam, he said, to hear you somehow makes me as merry as if the story was already written. But you've left out one of the chief characters, Samwise the Stout-Hearted. I want to hear more about Sam, Dad. Why didn't they put in more of his talk, Dad? <laughs> That's what I like. It makes me laugh. And Frodo wouldn't have gone far without Sam. Would he, Dad? Now, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, you shouldn't make fun. I was serious. So was I, said Frodo, and so I am. We're going on a bit too fast. You and I, Sam, are still stuck in the worst places of the story. And it is all too likely that some will say at this point, Shut the book now, Dad. We don't want to read any more. Maybe, said Sam, but I wouldn't be one to say that. Things done and over and made into a part of the great tales are different. Why, even Gollum might be good in a tale. Better than he is to have by you, anyway. And he used to like tales himself once, by his own account. I wonder if he thinks he's the hero or villain. Gollum! He called. Would you like to be the hero? Oh. Now where's he gone to again? There was no sign of him at the mouth of the shelter, nor in the shadows near. He had refused their food though he had, as usual, accepted a mouthful of water, and then he had seemed to curl up for sleep. They had supposed that one at any rate of his objects in his long absence the day before had been to hunt for food to his own liking, and now he had evidently slipped off again while they talked. But what for this time? I don't like his sneaking off without saying, said Sam, and least of all now. He can't be looking for food up here, not unless there's some kind of rock he fancies, Wait, there's, there isn't even a bit of moss. It's no good worrying about him now, said Frodo. We couldn't have got so far, not even within sight of the pass without him. And so we'll have to put up with his ways. If he's false, he's false. All the same, I'd rather have him under my eye, said Sam. All the more so if he's false. Do you remember he never would say it if this pass was guarded or no? And now we see a tower there. And it may be deserted, and it may not. Do you think he's gone to fetch them? Orcs, or whatever they are? No, I don't think so, answered Frodo. Even if he's up to some wickedness, and I suppose that's not unlikely, I don't think it's that. Not to fetch orcs or any servants of the enemy. Why wait till now and go through all the labor of the climb and come so near the land he fears? He could probably have betrayed us to orcs many times since we met him. If it's anything, it will be some little private trick of his own that he thinks is quite secret. Well, I suppose you're right, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. Not that it comforts me mightily. I don't make no mistake. I don't doubt he'd hand me over to orcs as gladly as kiss his hand. But I was forgetting his precious. Now, I suppose the whole time it's been the precious of poor Smeagol. That's the one idea in all his little schemes if he has any. But how bringing us up here will help him in, that is more than I can guess. Very likely he can't guess himself, said Frodo. And I don't think he's got just one plain scheme in his muddled head. I think he really is in part trying to save the precious from the enemy, as long as he can. For that would be the last disaster for himself too, if the enemy got it. And in the other part, perhaps, he's just biding his time and waiting on chance. Yes, slinker and stinker, as I've said before, said Sam. But the nearer they get to the enemy's land, the more like stinker slinker will get. Mark my words, if we ever get to the pass, 
He won't let us really take the precious thing over the border without making some kind of trouble. We haven't got there yet, said Frodo. No, but we'd better keep our eyes skinned till we do. If we're caught napping, Stinker will come out on top pretty quick. Not but what it would be safe for you to have a wink now, Master. Safe if you lay close to me. I'd be dearly glad to see you have sleep. I'd keep watch over you, and anyway, if you lay near with my arm around you, no one would come pulling you without your Sam knowing it. Sleep, said Frodo, and sighed, as if out of a desert he had seen a mirage of cool green. Yes, even here I could sleep. Sleep then, Master. Lay your head in my lap. And so Gollum found them hours later when he returned, crawling and creeping down the path out of the gloom ahead. Sam sat propped against the stone, his head dropping sideways and his breathing heavy. In his lap lay Frodo's head, drowned deep in sleep. Upon his white forehead lay one of Sam's brown hands, and the other lay softly upon his master's breast. Peace was in both their faces. Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes, and they went dim and grey, old and tired. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him, and he turned away, peering back up towards the pass, shaking his head, as if engaged in some interior debate. Then he came back, and slowly putting out a trembling hand, very cautiously, he touched Frodo's knee. But almost the touch was a caress. For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him, they would have thought that they beheld an old, weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time, beyond friends and kin, and the fields and streams of youth. An old, starved, pitiable thing. But at that touch, Frodo stirred and cried out softly in his sleep, and immediately Sam was wide awake. The first thing he saw was Gollum, pawing at Master as he thought. Hey you! He said roughly. What are you up to? Said Gollum softly. I dare say, said Sam. But where have you been to, snaking off and snaking back, you old villain? Gollum withdrew himself, and a green glint flickered under his heavy lids. Almost spider-like, he looked now, crouched back on his bent limbs, with his protruding eyes. The fleeting moment had passed, beyond recall. He hissed. Nice hobbits, Smeagol! Brings them up secret ways that nobody else could find. Tired he is. Thirsty he is. Yes, thirsty. And he guides them. And he searches for paths. And they say, Sneak! Sneak! Very nice, friends. Oh, yes, my precious. Very nice. Very nice. Sam felt a bit remorseful, though not more trustful. Sorry, he said. I'm sorry, but you startled me on my sleep. And I shouldn't have been sleeping, and that made me a bit sharp. But Mr. Frodo, he's that tired. I asked him to have a wink, and well, that's how it is. Sorry. But where have you been to? Sneaky, said Gollum, and the green glint did not leave his eyes. Oh, very well, said Sam. Have it your own way. I don't suppose it's so far from the truth. And now we'd better all be sneaking along together. What's the time? Is it today or tomorrow? It's tomorrow, said Gollum. Or this was tomorrow when hobbits went to sleep. Very foolish, very dangerous, of course. Mikra wasn't sneaking about to watch. I think we shall get tired of that word soon, said Sam. Well, never mind. I'll wake Master up. Gently, he smoothed the hair back from Frodo's brow, and bending down, he spoke softly to him. Wake up, Mr. Frodo. Wake up. Frodo stirred and opened his eyes, and smiled, seeing Sam's face bending over him. Calling me early, are you, Sam? He said. It's dark still. Yes, it's always dark here, said Sam, 
But Gollum's come back, Mr. Frodo, and he says it's tomorrow. So he must be walking on. The last lap. Frodo drew a deep breath and sat up. The last lap, he said. Hello, Smeagol. Found any food? Have you had any rest? Nerve. Nothing, Professor. Said Gollum. He's a sneak. Sam clicked his tongue, but restrained himself. Don't take names to yourself, Smeagol, said Frodo. It's unwise whether they are true or false. Smeagol has to take what's given him, answered Gollum. He was given that name by kind master Samwise, the hobbit that knew no match. Frodo looked at Sam. Yes, sir, he said. I did use the word. Waking up out of my sleep, sudden and all, and finding him at hand. I said I was sorry, but I soon shan't be. Come, let it pass then, said Frodo. But now we seem to have come to the point. You and I, Smeagol. Tell me, can we find the rest of the way by ourselves? We're in sight of the pass, of a way in, and if we can find it now, then I suppose our agreement can be said to be over. You have done what you promised. And you're free. Free to go back to food, and rest, and wherever you wish to go, except to servants of the enemy. And one day I may reward you. I, or those that remember. No, no! Not yet! Not yet! Gollum whined. Oh, no, no! Oh, no! They can't find the way themselves, can they? No, indeed! There's the tunnel coming. Smeagol must go on. No rest. No food. Not yet. It may indeed have been daytime now, as Gollum said, but the hobbits could see little difference. Unless, perhaps, the heavy sky above was less utterly black more like a great roof of smoke, while instead of the darkness of deep night which lingered still in cracks and holes, a grey blurring shadow shrouded the stony world about them. They passed on. Gollum in front and the hobbits now side by side, up the long ravine between the piers and columns of torn and weathered rock, standing like huge unshapen statues on either hand. There was no sound. Some way ahead, a mile or so perhaps, was a great grey wall. A last huge, upthrusting mass of mountain stone. Darker it loomed, and steadily it rose as they approached, until it towered high above them, shutting out the view of all that lay beyond. Deep shadow lay before its feet. Sam sniffed the air. Oh, that smell, he said. It's getting stronger and stronger. Presently they were under the shadow, and there in the midst of it they saw the opening of a cave. This is the way in, said Gollum softly. This is the entrance to the tunnel. He did not speak its name. Torech Ungol, Shelob's lair. Out of it came a stench, not the sickly odor of decay in the meads of Morgul, but a foul reek, as if filth unnameable were piled and hoarded in the dark within. Is this the only way, Smeagol? said Frodo. Yes, yes, he answered. Yes, we must go this way now. You mean to say that you've been through this hole? said Sam. Yeah. But perhaps you don't mind bad smells. Gollum's eyes glinted. He doesn't know what we mind, does he, precious? No, no, he doesn't. But Smeagol can burn things. Yes, he's been Oh, yes, right through. It's the only way. that smell, I wonder, said Sam. It's like, I wouldn't like to say, some beastly hole of the orcs, I'll warrant, with a hundred years of their filth in it. Well, said Frodo, it's the only way we must take it. Drawing a deep breath, they passed inside. In a few steps, they were in utter and impenetrable dark. Not since the lightless passages of Moria had Frodo or Sam known such darkness, and if possible, 
Here it was deeper and denser. There they were airs moving, and echoes, and a sense of space. Here the air was still, stagnant, heavy, and sound fell dead. They walked as it were in a black vapour, wrought a veritable darkness itself that, as it was breathed, brought blindness, not only to the eyes, but to the mind, so that even the memory of colours and forms and of any light faded out of thought. Night always has been, and always would be, and night was all. But for a while they could still feel, and indeed the senses of their feet and fingers at first seemed sharpened almost painfully. The walls felt, to their surprise, smooth, and the floor save for a step now and again, was straight and even, going ever up at the same stiff slope. The tunnel was high and wide, so wide that, though the hobbits walked abreast, only touching the side walls with their outstretched hands, they were separated, cut off alone, in the darkness. Gollum had gone in first, and seemed to be only a few steps ahead. While they were still able to give heed to such things, they could hear his breath hissing and gasping just in front of them. But after a time, their senses became duller. Both touch and hearing seemed to grow numb, and they kept on, groping, walking, on and on, mainly by the force of the will with which they had entered. Will to go through and desire to come at last to the high gate beyond. Before they had gone, very far perhaps, but time and distance soon passed out of his reckoning. Sam on the right, feeling the wall, was aware that there was an opening at the side. For a moment he caught a faint breath of some air less heavy, and they passed by it. There's more than one passage here, he whispered with an effort. It seemed hard to make his breath give any sound. It's as orc-like a place as ever there could be. After that... First he on the right, and then Frodo on the left passed three or four such openings, some wider, some smaller, but there was yet no doubt of the main way, for it was straight, and did not turn, and still went steadily up. But how long was it? How much more of this would they have to endure, or could they endure? The breathlessness of the air was growing as they climbed, and now they seemed often in the blind dark to sense some resistance, thicker than the foul air. As they thrust forward, they felt things brush against their hands, or against their hands, long tentacles, or hanging growths perhaps. They could not tell what they were, and still the stench grew. It grew until almost it seemed to them that smell was the only clear sense left to them, and that was for their torment. One hour, two hours, three hours, how many had they passed in this lightless hole? Hours, days, weeks rather. Sam left the tunnel side and shrank towards Frodo, and their hands met and clasped, and so together they still went on. At length, Frodo, groping along the left-hand wall, came suddenly to a void. Almost he fell sideways into the emptiness. There was some opening in the rock far wider than any they had yet passed, and out of it came a reek so foul, and a sense of lurking malice so intense, that Frodo reeled, and at that moment Sam stood lurched and fell forwards. Fighting off both the sickness and the fear, Frodo gripped Sam's hand. He said in a hoarse breath without voice, It all comes from here, the stench. How for it? Quick! Holding up his remaining strength and resolution, he dragged Sam to his feet and forced his own limbs to move. Sam stumbled beside him. One step, two steps, three steps, and at last six steps. Maybe they had passed the dreadful unseen opening, but whether that was so or not, suddenly it was easier to move as if some hostile will for the moment had released them. They struggled on, still hand in hand. But almost at once they came to a new difficulty. The tunnel forked, or so it seemed, and in the dark they could not tell which was the wider way, nor which kept nearer to the strait. Which should they take, the left or the right? They knew of nothing to guide them, yet a false choice could almost certainly be fatal. Which way has Gollum gone? Panted Sam. And why didn't he wait? Smeagol, said Frodo, trying to call, but his voice croaked, and the name fell dead almost as it left his lips. There was no answer, not an echo, not even a tremor of the air. He's really gone this time, I fancy, muttered Sam. It's just exactly where he meant to bring us. 
If I ever lay my hands on you again, you'll be sorry for it. Presently, groping and fumbling in the dark, they found that the opening on the left was blocked. Either it was a blind, or else some great stone had fallen in the passage. This can't be the way, Frodo whispered. Right or wrong, we must take the other. And quick, Sam panted. There is something worse than Gollum about. I can feel something looking at us. They had not gone more than a few yards when from behind them came a sound. Startling and horrible in the heavy padded silence. A gurgling, bubbling noise. And a long, venomous hiss. They wheeled round, but nothing could be seen. Still in stones they stood, staring, waiting for they did not know what. Said Sam, and he laid his hands upon the hilt of his sword, and as he did so, he thought of the darkness of the barrow whence it came. I wish your top was near us now he thought. Then as he stood, darkness about him and the blackness of despair and anger in his heart. It seemed to him that he saw a light. A light in his mind, almost unbearably bright at first, as a sun ray to the eyes of one long hidden in a windowless pit. Then the light became colour. Green, gold, silver, white. Far off, as in a little picture drawn by elven fingers, he saw the Lady Galadriel standing on the grass in Noria and gifts were in her hands. And you, ring bearer, he heard her say, remote but clear, for you I have prepared this. The bubbling hiss drew nearer, and there was a creaking as of some great jointed thing that moved with slow purpose in the dark. A reek came before it. Master! Master! cried Sam, and the life and urgency came back into his voice. Lady's gift! The star glass! The light to you in dark places she said it was to be! The star glass! The star glass! muttered Frodo, as one answering out of sleep, hardly comprehending. Why, oh, yes! Why had I forgotten it? A light when all other lights go out! And now we need light alone can help us! Slowly his hand went to his bosom, and slowly he held aloft the phial of Galadriel. For a moment it glimmered, faint as a rising star struggling in heavy earthwind mists, and then as its power waxed, and hope grew in Frodo's mind, it began to burn and kindled to a silver flame. A minute's heart of dazzling light, as though Earendil had himself come down from the high sunset paths with the last Silmaril upon his brow. The darkness receded from it until it seemed to shine in the center of a globe of airy crystal, and the hand that held it sparkled with white fire. Frodo gazed in wonder at this marvelous gift that he had so long carried, not guessing its full worth and potency. Seldom had he remembered it on the road until they came to Mordgul Vale, and never had he used it for fear of its revealing light. He cried, and knew not what he had spoken, for it seemed that another voice spoke through his, clear, untroubled by the foul air of the pit. But other potencies there are in Middle-earth, powers of night, they are old and strong. And she that walked in the darkness had heard the elves cry that cry far back in the deeps of time. And she had not heeded it, and it did not daunt her now. Even as Frodo spoke, he felt a great malice bent upon him, and a deadly regard considering him. Not far down the tunnel, between them and the opening, where they had reeled and stumbled, he was aware of eyes, growing visible, two great clusters of many windowed eyes. The coming menace was unmasked at last. The radiance of the star glass was broken and thrown back from their thousand facets, but behind the glitter a pale, deadly fire began steadily to glow within, a flame kindled in some deep pit of evil thought. Monstrous and abominable eyes they were, bestial and yet filled with purpose and with hideous delight gloating over their prey, trapped beyond all hope of escape. Frodo and Sam, horror-stricken, began slowly to back away, their own gaze held by the dreadful stare of those baleful eyes. But as they backed, so the eyes advanced. Frodo's hand wavered, and slowly the file drooped. Then, suddenly, released from the holding spell to run a little in vain panic for the amusement of the eyes, they both turned and fled together. But even as they ran, Frodo looked back and saw with terror that at once the eyes came leaping up behind. The stench of death was like a cloud about him. Stand! 
Stand! He cried desperately. Running is no use! Slowly the eyes crept nearer. He called, and gathering his courage, he lifted up the file once more. The eyes halted. For a moment their regard relaxed, as if some hint of doubt troubled them. Then Frodo's heart flamed within him, and without thinking what he did, whether it was folly or despair or courage, he took the file in his left hand, and with his right hand drew his sword. Sting flashed out, and a sharp elven blade sparkled in silver light. But at its edges a blue fire flickered. Then holding the star aloft and the bright sword advanced, Frodo, hobbit of the Shire, walked steadily down to meet the eyes. They wavered. Doubt came into them as the light approached. One by one they dimmed, and slowly they drew back. No brightness so deadly had ever afflicted them before. From sun and moon and star they had been safe underground, but now a star had descended into the very earth. Still it approached, and the eyes began to quail. One by one they all went dark, and turned away, and a green bulk beyond the light's reach heaved its huge shadow in between. They were gone. Cried Sam. He was close behind, his own sword drawn and ready. Stars in glory! But the elves will make a song of that if they ever heard of it. And may I live to tell them and hear them sing. But don't go on, Master. Don't go down to that then. And so back they turned once more. First walking and then running, for as they went the floor of the tunnel rose steeply, and with every side they climbed higher above the stenches of the unseen lair, and strength returned to limb and heart. But still the hatred of the Watcher lurked behind them, blind for a while perhaps, but undefeated, still bent on death. And now there came a flow of air to meet them, cold and thin, the opening, the tunnel's end, at last was before them. Panting, yearning for a roofless place, they flung themselves forward and then in amazement they staggered, stumbling back. The outlet was blocked, with some barrier but not of stone, soft and a little yielding it seemed, and yet strong and impervious, air filtered through, but not a glimmer of any light. Once more they charged and were hurled back. Holding aloft the file, Frodo looked, and before him he saw a greyness which the radiance of the star glass did not pierce, and did not illuminate as if it were a shadow that, being cast by no light, no light could dissipate. Across the width and height of the tunnel a vast web was spun, orderly as the web of some huge spider, but denser woven, and far greater, and each thread was as thick as rope. Sam laughed grimly. He said, What webs? What a spider! Have at it! In a fury he hewed at them with his sword, but the thread that he struck did not break. It gave a little and then sprang back like a plucked bowstring, turning the blade and tossing up both sword and arm. Three times Sam struck with all his force, and at last one single cord of all the countless cords snapped and twisted, curling and whipping through the air. One end of it lashed Sam's hand, and he cried out in pain, starting back and drawing his hand across his mouth. It will take days to clear a road like this, he said. What should be done? Have those eyes come back? No, not to be seen, said Frodo. But I still feel that they are looking at me, or thinking about me, making some other plan, perhaps. If this light were lowered, or if it failed, then they would quickly come again. Trapped in the end, said Sam bitterly, his anger rising again above weariness and despair. Gnats in a net! May the curse of Faramir bite the golem and bite him quick! That would not help us now, said Frodo. Come, let us see what Sting can do. It is an elven blade, and there were webs of horror in the dark ravines of Beleriand where it was forged. But you must be the guard and hold back the eyes. Here, take the star glass. Do not be afraid. Hold it up and watch. Then Frodo stepped up to the great grey net, and hewed it with a wide sweeping stroke, drawing the bitter edge swiftly across a ladder of close run cords, and at once springing away. The blue gleaming blade shore through them like a sigh through grass, and they leapt and writhed and then hung loose. A great rent was made. Stroke after stroke he dealt until at last the web within his reach was shattered, and the upper portion blew and swayed like a loose veil in the incoming wind. The trap was broken. Come! cried Frodo. Wild joy at their escape from the very mouth of despair suddenly filled all his mind. His head whirled as with a draught of potent wine. He sprang out, shouting as he came. It seemed light in that dark land to his eyes that had passed through the den of night. 
The great smokes had risen and grown thinner, and the last hours of somber day were passing. The red glare of Mordor had died away in sullen gloom. It had seemed to Frodo that he looked upon a morning of sudden hope. Almost he had reached the summit of the wall. Only a little higher now. The cleft, Kirithungul, was before him. A dim notch in the black ridge and the horns of rock darkling in the sky on either side. A short race, a sprinter's course, and he would be through. The past, Sam! He cried, not heeding the shrillness of his voice that released from the choking airs of the tunnel rang out now high and wild. Sam came up behind as fast as he could urge his legs, but glad that he was to be free, he was uneasy and as he ran he kept on glancing back at the dark arch of the tunnel, fearing to see eyes or some shape beyond his imagining spring out in pursuit. Too little did he or his master know of the craft of Shelob. She had many exits from her lair. There, age long, she had dwelt, an evil thing in spider form. Even such as once of old had lived in the land of the elves in the west that is now under the sea. Such as Baron fought in the mountains of terror in Doriath, and so came to Luthien upon the green sward amid the hemlocks in the moonlight long ago. How Shelob came there, flying from ruin, no tale tells. For out of the dark years few tales have come, but still she was there who was there before Sauron, and before the first stone of Barad-dûr. And she served none but herself, drinking the blood of elves and men, bloated and grown fat with endless brooding on her feasts, weaving webs of shadow. For all living things were her food, and her vomit darkness. Far and wide her lesser broods, bastards of the miserable mates, her own offspring, that she slew, spread from glen to glen, from the Ethel Duath to the eastern hills, to Dol Guldur and the fastness of Mirkwood. But none could rival her, Shelob the Great, last child of Ungoliant to trouble the unhappy world. Already years before, Gollum had beheld her, Smeagol, who pried into all dark holes, and in past days he had bowed and worshipped her and the darkness of her evil will walked through all the ways of his weariness beside him, cutting him off from light and from regret, and he had promised to bring her food. But her lust was not his lust. Little she knew of or cared for towers or rings or anything devised by mind or hand, who only desired death for all others, mind and body. And for herself, a glut of life, alone, swollen till the mountains could no longer hold her up, and the darkness could not contain her. But that desire was yet far away, and long now she had been hungry, lurking in her den while the power of Sauron grew, and light and living things forsook his borders, and the city of the valley was dead, and no elf or man came near, only the unhappy orcs, poor food and weary. But she must eat. And however busily they delved new winding passages from the pass and from their tower, ever she found some way to snare them. But she lusted for sweeter meat, and Gollum had brought it to her. Where is she? Where is she? He said often to himself, when the evil mood was on him, as he walked the dangerous road from Emin Wheel to Morgul Vale. Where is she? May well be. Oh yes, it may well be that when she throws away bones and empty garments. We shall find it. We shall get it. We reward for poor Smeagol, who brings nice food and will save the precious Must. Oh, yes. And when we've got it safe, then she Oh yes, then we'll pay her back, my precious, then we'll pay everyone back. So he thought in an inner chamber of his cunning, which he still hoped to hide from her, even when he had come to her again and had bowed low before her while his companions slept. And as for Sauron, he knew where she lurked, 
It pleased him that she should dwell there hungry but unabated in malice, a more sure watch upon that ancient path into his land than any other that his skill could have devised. And orcs, they were useful slaves, but he had them in plenty. If now and again Shelob caught them to stay her appetite, she was welcome. He could spare them. And sometimes, as a man may cast a dainty to his cat, his cat, he calls her, but she owns him not. Sauron would send her prisoners that he had no better uses for. He would have them driven to her hole, and report brought back to him of the play she made. So they both lived, delighting in their own devices, and fearing no assault, nor wrath, nor any end of their wickedness. Never yet had any fly escaped from Shelob's webs, and the greater now was her rage and hunger. But nothing of this evil which they had stirred up against them did poor Sam know. Even that a fear was growing on him, a menace which he could not see, and such a weight did it become that it was a burden to him to run, and his feet seemed leaden. Dread was round him and enemies before him in the past and his master was in the fey mood, running heedlessly to meet them. Turning his eyes away from the shadow behind and a deep gloom beneath the cliff upon his left, he looked ahead, and he saw two things that increased his dismay. He saw that the sword which Frodo still held unsheathed was glittering with blue flame, and he saw that though the sky behind him was now dark, still the window in the tower was glowing red. He muttered, We'll never rush it like this. There's orcs about and worse than orcs. Then returning quickly to his long habit of secrecy, he closed his hand about the precious file, which he still bore. Red with his own living blood, his hand shone for a moment, and then he thrust the revealing light deep into a pocket near his breast and drew his elven cloak about him. Now he tried to quicken his pace. His master was gaining on him. Already he was some twenty strides ahead, flitting on like a shadow. Soon he would be lost to light in that grey world. Hardly had Sam hidden the light of the star glass when she came. A little way ahead to his left he saw suddenly, issuing from the black hole of shadow under the cliff, the most loathly shape that he had ever beheld, horrible beyond the horror of an evil dream. Most like a spider ship, but huger than the great hunting beasts, and more terrible than they because of the evil purpose in her remorseless eyes. Those same eyes that he had thought daunted and defeated, there they were lit with a fell light again. Clustering in her outthrust head, great horns she had, and behind her short stalk-like neck was her huge swollen body, a vast bloated bag swaying and sagging between her legs. Its great bulk was black, blotched with livid marks, but the belly underneath was pale and luminous and gave forth a stench. Her legs were bent with great knobbed joints high above her back, and hairs that stuck out like steel pines, and at each leg's end there was a claw. As soon as she had squeezed her soft squelching body and its folded limbs out of the upper exit from her lair, she moved with horrible speed, now running on her creaking legs, now making a sudden bound. She was between Sam and his master. Either she did not see Sam, or she avoided him for the moment as the bearer of the light, and fixed all her intent upon one prey. Upon Frodo, bereft of his file, running heedless up the path, unaware yet of his peril. Swiftly he ran, but Shelob was swifter. In a few leaps she would have him. Sam gasped and gathered all his remaining breath to shout. Behind! He yelled. Look out, master! I'm... But suddenly his cry was stifled. A long, clammy hand went over his mouth, and another caught him by the neck, while something wrapped itself about his leg. Taken off his guard, he toppled backwards into the arms of his attacker. Got him! Hissed Gollum in his ear. At last, my precious, we've got him. Zealous, the nasty habit. We take this one. She'll get Zother. Oh, yes, she'll forget him. Not Smeagol. He promised he won't eat Master at all. But he's got you, you nasty, frothy little sneak. He spat on Sam's neck. <laughs> Fury at the treachery and desperation at the delay when his master was in deadly peril gave to Sam a sudden violence and strength that was far beyond anything Gollum had expected from this slow, stupid hobbit, as he thought it. What Gollum himself would have twisted more quickly or more fiercely. His hold on Sam's mouth slipped, and Sam ducked and lunged forward. Again trying to tear away from the grip on his neck, his sword was still in his hand and on his left arm. Hanging by its thong was Faramir's staff. 
Desperately, he tried to turn and stab his enemy, but gone was too quick. His long right arm shot out, and he grabbed Sam's wrist. His fingers were like a vice. Slowly and relentlessly, he bent the hand down and forward. Till with the cry of pain, Sam released the sword and it fell to the ground. And all the while, Gollum's other hand was tightening on Sam's throat. Then Sam played his last trick. With all his strength, he pulled away and got his feet firmly planted. Then suddenly, he drove his legs against the ground and with his whole force, hurled himself backwards. Not expecting even this simple trick from Sam, Gollum fell over with Sam on top. And he received the weight of the sturdy hobbit in his stomach. A sharp hiss came out of him, and for a second his hand upon Sam's throat loosened, but his fingers still gripped the sword hand. Sam tore himself forward and away, and stood up, and then quickly he wheeled away to his right, pivoted on the wrist held by Gollum. Laying hold of the staff with his left hand, Sam swung up, and down it came with a whistling crack on Gollum's outstretched arm, just below the elbow. With a squeal, Gollum let go. Then Sam rounded in. Not waiting to change the staff from left to right, he dealt another savage blow. Quick as a snake, Gollum slithered his eye, and the stroke aimed at his head fell across his back. The staff cracked and broke. That was enough for him. Grabbing from behind was an old game of his, and seldom had he failed in it. But this time, misled by spite, he had made the mistake of speaking and gloating before he had both hands on his victim's neck. Everything had gone wrong with his beautiful plan, since that horrible light had so unexpectedly appeared in the darkness. And now he was face to face with the furious enemy little less than his own size. This fight was not for him. Sam swept up his sword from the ground and raised it. Gollum squealed and springing aside onto all fours, he jumped away in one big bound like a frog. Before Sam could reach him, he was off, running with amazing speed back towards the tunnel. Sword in hand, Sam went after him. For a moment he had forgotten everything else but the red fury in his brain and the desire to kill Gollum. But before he could overtake him, Gollum was gone. Then as the dark hole stood before him and the stench came out to meet him, like a clap of thunder, the thought of Frodo and the monster smote upon Sam's mind. He spun round and rushed wildly up the path, calling and calling his master's name. He was too late. So far, Gollum's plot had succeeded. <laughs>